there, my meteorology students, Dr. John Schrage here, and we're going to start working on a lecture that's about the forces that are acting on the atmosphere to create winds. And when we talk about winds in this sense here, what we mean is like approximations to the wind. You're going to see what I'm talking about in just a little bit, but um, you know, we'll just we'll have words to describe the wind under different conditions, like the winds in a tornado are cyclostrophic. What does it mean to be a cyclostrophic wind? Or winds around an anticyclone will be uh, geostrophic. Okay, what does that mean exactly? So we're going to be learning about this idea about different kinds of forces that work and different kinds of winds and so on. And so just sort of to kind of give you a little preview as to what we're going to be talking about. In this lecture, we're going to be learning about the forces that accelerate the wind. We're going to have to make sure that we're sure about the word force. So we're going to have to make sure that we're sure about that word accelerate and maintain the winds. Why, why does the wind blow the way it does? In this lecture, we're also going to be learning about the force balances that are at work in the atmosphere. At any given time, any object that's in motion is typically experiencing quite a few different forces. It is the sum of those forces and how that some of them balance each other that is what determines the, mo the motion and the acceleration of the, of the object in question here. Now, I want to draw your attention, by the way, to something about this particular lecture. I don't normally label individual slides, like with numbers down here in the corner, the way I did in this one. Uh, so I wanted to draw your attention that that's there, because I think we'll need to rely on that from time to time to make sure that we all understand where we are. All right, we're going to start talking about forces, these kind of different processes that are at work that can be acting on objects. That object could be a rocket. It could be an aircraft, it could be an air parcel, okay? Now, obviously, in the context of wind, what we're talking about is air parcels. We want to know, here's a volume of air that we are going to move. What's making it move? What is causing the wind? And this is something that has been studied for literally centuries in terms of understanding how motions work. And it was good old Isaac Newton in his second law that determined how force is related to how objects move. And it was somewhat of a surprise to find out it isn't so much the motion of the objects that is determined by the forces that are acting on them. It is how the objects are accelerating that is determined by the forces that are acting on them. Forces are going to have some kind of direction associated with them, like there is a force of gravity pulling downward, or there might be a force of friction slowing an object down that's kind of working against the motion. There can be different forces acting on any given object at any given time. They have a direction and they have a magnitude. If you're a survivor of like a high school physics class or something like that, you probably know that when a quantity has a, a direction and a magnitude, we describe it as being a vector. Forces are vectors, and we draw them using arrows or vectors on a piece of paper or on a PowerPoint screen or whatever. And these forces can add up and cancel each other out and so on. Uh, they can be equal but opposite to each other and cancel out and so on, and they create accelerations. That was really Newton's big insight. The motion of an object isn't necessarily what's being caused by the forces. It's how it's accelerating. Accelerating here in the sense of changing the speed or direction of the motion. So like an object that is moving at a constant speed is not accelerating. Uh, well, at constant speed in a constant direction. Therefore, there's no net force acting on the object. Whereas, you know, an object that isn't moving can have forces acting on it. They just are canceling each other out or something like that. This was really Newton's big insight here. Because typically there are going to be several forces acting on objects at any given time. And the net change of motion, that's what acceleration is. It's a change of motion. Not motion, change in motion. The acceleration of the object then depends on how all those forces add up. Um, if the forces add up to zero, that is to say they cancel each other out, then the object will not be an accelerating. We'll describe that object as then being in some kind of force balance. And that's going to be the easiest type of situation to understand when we actually start talking about, like, winds. Air parcels achieve some kind of force balance where now, yes, there are lots of different forces acting on that air parcel, but they cancel out. There'll be a force this direction balanced by a force that direction, and so on.
This is a really important idea in the history of science. I can't begin to tell you how important Newton's second law is to everything in our day-to-day -day life. It is the law that you probably saw in like a high school science class or something like that, F equals ma, where force equals mass of the object times acceleration. Remember when you have two, num two letters run together like that, it just means times. So force, times, force equals mass times acceleration. So if you know the force acting on an object, and you know its mass, you can determine how much it'll accelerate, all right? Whether that is the force of the thrust of this rocket accelerating the rocket upward or whatever you're interested in knowing how it changes. In this case, of course, in this class, we're gonna focus on air parcels because we wanna see what accelerates them and then what maintains the speed that they're traveling at. We briefly mentioned Newton's second law back in the last lecture because we were talking at that time about the fact that the behavior of the atmosphere is governed by so-called seven primitive equations. Um, this term primitive equations doesn't mean as in like they're cavemen thumping on their chest. It means primitive as in we've gotten it down to basics. Okay, And two of them happen to be expressions of, the New of Newton's second law. Um, the fact that it takes two of them and so on, that's not hugely relevant as to what's going on here. But even though Newton's second law is just F equals MA, which doesn't sound like the worst thing in the world, in practice, actually, Newton, these two primitive equations become very large when you actually write them out in the form that meteorologists use because the mathematical representation of these forces becomes very, very complicated. Right? It takes like a sheet of paper to write out the full form of Newton's first law, I'm sorry, Newton's second law as it applies in the atmospheric sciences, but that doesn't mean we can't understand it. We can talk about the different forces that are at work and explain how they add up to either add up to zero, like they cancel each other out and we have a force balance, or they don't and we have a net acceleration. All right, so we're going to use kind of more of a, 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 a model here of thinking about this and discussing it and so on, rather than like talking about the mathematical representations, which I think occasionally your book tries. Okay, that's just not the most important thing in this class. But let's get to this idea here about forces being in balance or pure forces being out of balance. And before we talk about an air parcel and talk about winds, let's talk about an aircraft. Here's a jumbo jet taking off. And there are lots of forces acting on this jumbo jet at any given time. Um, some of them are in the vertical direction, some of them are going to be in the horizontal direction, as you can see. And I just want to use this as a way of illuminating what I'm talking about when I talk about these different forces and how they work and they come together and so on. So, like, for example, during takeoff, now that's, you know, that's it's important here, during takeoff, there's a couple of forces acting in the vertical direction. For example, I mean, the aircraft has mass, there's gravity, so therefore there is the force of gravity, that is to say the weight of the aircraft pushing downward. If that were the only force acting on the air parcel, and, I'm sorry, the aircraft in a vertical direction, the aircraft would start accelerating downward. Okay, there would be a net force downward and the aircraft would, you know, crash. But during takeoff, there is another force in the vertical direction. The wings generate lift, which is a vertical force, and it is pushing upward. We aren't going to worry in this class as to how wings do it. We have, we have faith that aircraft do this. During takeoff, the force of lift on the wing is greater than the force of gravity pushing down. If we added up the magnitude of these two forces, they would not balance each other. There would be a net upward force, and so by Newton's second law, there's a net upward acceleration. The plane isn't just moving up. I mean, if it was moving upward at a constant speed, that wouldn't be any acceleration. It's going from having no vertical motion to having eventually a fairly fast vertical motion. I mean, by the time a few minutes into the flight, the plane needs to be climbing at quite a few meters per second if it's going to reach cruising altitude, right? So there is a net upward acceleration because the force of lift exceeds the force of gravity. Same with like the horizontal direction. During the takeoff of the aircraft, the aircraft is going from not moving and having zero forward speed to eventually having a very fast forward speed. There is an acceleration going on. And we can explain that acceleration by thinking about Newton's second law. At any given time, there's friction, which in the context of aircraft we, talk, we call drag, but it's the same kind of idea. There's drag on this airplane, slowing it down. We draw a 
force that's slowing something down, like friction, as a vector pointing in the opposite direction, like this vector I ever labeled drag. But the engines of the aircraft are producing enormous amounts of force in the forward direction. In the context of aircraft, we call that thrust. So the aircraft's engines are producing much more thrust than there is drag. Therefore, if you added these forces up, there is a net forward force pushing the aircraft forward. And by Newton's second law, then there should be a net forward acceleration. The point isn't moving forward. Well, it is, it's just that's not relevant. It's accelerating forward. Its velocity in the forward direction is increasing. All that is very different when we're at cruising altitude. When the aircraft hits cruising altitude, it reaches a place where it's a height in the atmosphere where it is no longer trying to go up or down. It's trying to stay at its current height. It's trying to have no vertical speed. Its vertical speed should not be changing. It should be zero. Um, in order to have that happen, the forces acting in the vertical direction need to balance each other out. And so the pilot has his, I don't, I'm not a pilot, they, you know, they taper the flaps and things like that and throttle back the engines and so on in such a way that the engine, that the wing rather, is still producing lift, but now that lift is equal to the force of gravity. The plane has just as many, the unit is newtons, newtons of force pushing up on the wings as it has newtons of gravity pushing downward, because newtons are our unit of force. And so there is no net vertical force acting on the aircraft, and therefore there is no net vertical acceleration acting on the aircraft. And therefore, the vertical velocity doesn't change. Therefore, okay, if the vertical velocity was zero meters per second before, it stays vertical, zero meters per second. The aircraft stays at the same altitude. The forces are in balance. In the same sort of way, it's a little bit more uh, technical here, but horizontally, as the plane is at cruising altitude, the pilot doesn't want the plane to keep going faster and faster and faster, nor does the pilot want the plane to slow down due to drag and friction and so on. So the pilot adjusts the thrust being produced by the jet aircraft's engines so that the thrust being produced by the engine exactly balances the drag being created by the surfaces of the aircraft due to friction and things like that. Perhaps you've noticed that when you're on board an aircraft and they reach cruising altitude, the engines throttle back somewhat, but the engines are still running. The engines have to continue to produce just exactly as much thrust as drag. Otherwise, there will be a net acceleration, a change in velocity. That net acceleration could be reducing the speed. It's weird to think of the word acceleration to mean reducing speed, but remember, it's just about change in speed. It's a negative acceleration when it's getting slower. Or... There could be a net positive acceleration, the plane would just get faster and faster and faster, neither of which is what the pilot wants. He wants them to be in force balance. He wants there to be no net acceleration. The plane is moving at, you know, a few hundred meters per second, but then we don't want any net acceleration. We don't want the plane to be getting faster and faster or slower and slower. This is an important idea to get in mind because we're going to need to have this idea of having Things can be in motion, but have no net forces acting on them because they're canceling each other out, and therefore there's no net acceleration. That is going to be hugely important when we start picking apart things like how wind blows and so on. And so when we talk about how there's forces in the atmosphere that are at work, accelerating air parcels if they're not, these forces are not in balance, or balancing each other out, and not accelerating the air parcels, which will be a much more powerful idea in terms of like understanding how tornadoes work or how... Um, cyclones or how the jet stream or something like that works. So this is where we're headed with this. But before we get there, I want to ask two quick questions. Question one, when multiple forces are acting on some object, it can be the case that all of the forces cancel out, add up to zero, producing A, no net motion, B, no net acceleration, or C, a violation of Newton's second law. Take a look at those three options and uh, make a choice and get some feedback before you move on to question two.